All right, so let's talk about the first lecture, which is here. And I don't have slides in this material I inherited from Urban. It's just books. It's a summary of the textbook, um, but it's not bad. We can use it this way. I'm, I'm trying to get used to using other people's stuff. I usually make all my own stuff, but uh, in order to be more modern, I'm trying to use this stuff. So digital forensics uh, is collecting data from any device that stores data in digital format, like cell phones and computers and iPads and everything else. And forensics is evidence ready to be prepared in court. Now, you've probably seen enough police procedurals to know that there's this thing called hearsay. If you're going to testify in court, if you see something yourself, you can testify about that. But if you just hear somebody else talk about something, that's not evidence. Uh, that is hearsay. If they tell you what they saw, um, and only the original person that directly experienced something can testify and have that be counted as evidence in court. However, there is an exception, and that is the expert witness, and that's what forensic examiners are. If you are an expert in a field, then your opinions count as evidence. So an expert forensic examiner can say, I examined this machine, and I can have an opinion based on my experience and training that uh, this person is innocent. Even though these files are found on this machine, I believe they were not created by this person. And here's the reason why. And um, there will be a forensic examiner on the other side analyzing the same evidence and trying to uh, justify the other side of the argument. So therefore, the forensic examiner must have impressive credentials. You must submit a resume and you go through a period of being examined in court where you present your credentials in education and such and uh, try to convince the jury that you are, in fact, a credible witness. And this is why a lot of college professors become expert witnesses. I haven't done it myself, although I've been offered the job, um, because it is pretty much the same thing. Being a college professor is taking something complicated and explaining it to students who may be beginners and testifying in court. As an expert witness is a matter of taking this thing and explaining it so the judge and the jury can understand it, which is very similar. So that's the game here. So as a forensic examiner, your job is to gather evidence from digital devices, preserve that evidence, and analyze it to answer important questions like, did this person commit this crime? All right. And so inculpatory evidence is what uh, incriminates the person uh, being accused of something. And exculpatory evidence is what uh, serves to free exonerate them. It serves to say that they did not do it. So computer forensics is not the same as computer security. Um, security is protecting something so that it's safe enough to use. Computer forensics is examining something to get evidence. It's related, part of the broad field of computer security, but not very, um, but not identical. Um, it's usually done on computers, but there are many other computers hidden in everything you use now. You've got smart cars and smartphones and USB drives. Many other devices beyond the typical computer are now included in digital forensics. Um, and it's used in all kinds of crime. Almost every crime scene now includes computer forensics. Even if you have, like, somebody gets shot with a gun, there's usually cell phone videos, and the victim has a cell phone in their pocket, and there's uh, cameras watching over it, and there's everything in the modern world has got digital records that have to be included. And um, one thing you can do with computer forensics is you can recover deleted files. That's a data recovery activity, and that's related to computer forensics, but that's not usually related to the crime and punishment part of it. <coughs> There's a great company up in Nevada called Drive Savers that is the expert in data recovery. And they're expensive, but they do the best job. And sometimes we get to take students on tours up there. They can recover data from um, machines that have been in fires, that have been run over by trucks, that have fallen to the bottom of lakes and sat there for years. They can recover data from almost anything. All right, so there's kinds of evidence you can get. Um, email is often one of the most important pieces of evidence because it's clear usually who wrote it and who sent it and when it was sent. So you know who did it and you, and it proves that this person actually did something, talked about something, made plans. Whereas otherwise, if you first find something like a file on, say, a USB drive, it might be difficult to figure out who put it there. Was it really this person? But with email, you know who's sending it, you know who's um, receiving it and when it happened. So you have a chain of events. And email, of course, is used by almost everybody. Uh, this is why, you know, Donald Trump is currently being accused of many crimes. But one of the reasons why it's very hard to prosecute him is he never uses emails or text messages or anything. 
He learned that from Roy Cohn many decades ago. Uh, you just never leave any trail behind like that. And then if someone wants to accuse you of a crime, it's very hard for them to find the evidence. This is what mobsters know, too. I'm not saying necessarily that Donald Trump is a mobster, but his techniques resemble that for the same reason. And you could say he's just doing it to be a smart businessman, or you could say he's a criminal, but that has not been proven. Although he's in a lot of trouble now, people are trying to prove it, but they're going to have trouble finding much of a digital trail about him. Um, so if you, if you tamper with evidence, that's modifying evidence, um, and that's a serious crime. Something people have tried several times is to falsify evidence to get somebody else in trouble. There was a case where um, people tried to plant child pornography on somebody else's computer. Child pornography is about one of the worst things you can possibly do. There's huge punishments for that. Possessing it at all is a felony. You can go to prison for like 14 years. So putting that on somebody else's machine is a way to frame them for a crime. And that, of course, is a crime in itself to falsify evidence for a purpose like that. Um, so you can determine what is admissible in court, although digital evidence is generally admissible in court. Um, and uh, one very strange feature of American law is that um, there is a law written about electronically stored files that dates from many decades ago when, it, when there was no internet. And it said anything left on a server for more than 180 days can be considered abandoned and you can inspect it without a search warrant. But in the modern world, your email just sits on a server typically forever. Like if you use Gmail, that's just sitting on Google server forever. So the email more than 180 days old is legally searchable without a search warrant because of this old law, which people have been trying to fix, but they have not been able to fix it yet. And by the way, if you don't know them, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is the ACLU for the internet. Um, you see them everywhere. You hear from them everywhere. They are the people trying to defend our rights on the internet a wonderful group of lawyers and, and other advocates, um, and trying to stop the many things that about, uh, the many ways privacy is invaded on the internet, and in many ways there are abuses. Then images stored on your computer are typically bitmap, JPEG, or ping, sometimes TIFF, and those are useful because of course you can see what's in the image, and if the people are doing something illegal, they sometimes take pictures of it, like child pornography, and then you know. And also images typically are stored with an owner and a creation date. And also often they are stored with a whole bunch of extra metadata, like the GPS location of where the camera was when it was taken. A lot of people don't know that. So finding the evidence inside images is extremely useful. And then a video, of course, the surveillance video all over the place. I think I read the average person is captured 50 or 100 times a day on surveillance video these days. Um, and of course, there are video, uh, video surveillance devices and ATM machines and ring doorbells everywhere. So there's lots of video evidence available, and that can be very useful. Um, here, by the way, is a skimmer. This is what criminals do. They attach skimmer devices like this with a ornamental cover onto ATM machines, which then take a video of you typing in your PIN. They capture the magnetic stripe when you put in your card, and they catch your PIN, and that's how they can steal your money. After you use an ATM, they can make a second copy of that information and go back in later and steal your money. And then, increasingly these days, people are taking their internet search history and taking it to court. There are some famous cases where someone wanted to commit a murder, and they, like a month before, were Googling what's the best poison to use, how to kill somebody, how to dispose of a body, and things like that. And that was used in court. So when you're using your computer on the internet, you're sending requests, you're getting web pages, and that's all being recorded on your machine and also at the other end. And it can be subpoenaed and uh, collected later, and that evidence can be used against you. This is why there's now a big uh, stir in the news, because uh, since all kinds of states are now outlawing abortion, and they're even offering, like Texas, a large financial reward for catching somebody trying to get an abortion, $10,000 for catching them, um, it would seem like just watching people's web searches about related to abortion would be enough to catch them. And people are now getting very concerned about uh, making that data more private. Um, right now, the data that records everything you're doing on the internet is just collected and sold for money by almost every company you deal with to advertisers and other companies. And police departments are now buying that data. And the FBI and CIA are buying that data. So they know they can just buy records of what you're doing. Cell phones 
are extremely important, perhaps the most important thing to analyze these days. Everybody carries them. They, it records your location everywhere you go. You have your videos, your texts, your emails, all sorts of good stuff on there. There are um, expensive forensic suites people purchase just to gather data from cell phones, expensive hardware devices. Um, it's a very rich source of evidence. And then, of course, the Internet of Things is just a generalization to all the other things, thermostats, lighting, cars, all the other gadgets you have. Everything now has a computer in it, and all those computers are full of evidence. And it, is, it requires a bit of uh, sophistication with hardware and software to get the evidence off of it. Although, by the way, the real evidence in court is the human testifying. So there have been cases that went to court where somebody wanted to get evidence off a cell phone and they didn't have any of these fancy computer forensic techniques, they would just page through the text messages and take pictures. And then those pictures would go to court. Now, this is a little bit unprofessional in that you didn't really get all the evidence off that phone. But the fact is, that's evidence. You got some of the evidence, it counts in court. The police person that did that will testify, I took the victim's cell phone, I took these pictures, this data was on that phone. That's evidence. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect or complete, it counts. The real evidence is the human testifying. So if you don't have the perfect way to get data off a device, you might be able to get some of the data using whatever skills and equipment you have. But the most important thing I'll probably mention many times in this course is whatever you do during a forensic investigation, keep complete notes. If a question comes up later saying, why did you use this procedure? That was the wrong procedure. You should have done something else. Always have complete notes. I've done this in things that went to, for, to court and well, went to for judges and, and uh, attorneys. And um, I kept complete notes of everything you do. If you make a mistake, like you accidentally erase something, write it down, don't lie about it, don't cover it up. The worst thing you can ever do is lie or cover anything up. Just write down what you did and make sure you can later, and the questions come up, you can explain exactly what you did. And if you did it wrong, there may be some punishment, but there's no punishment worse than what if you lie or cover it up. So anyway, um, keep notes of what you do. So what skills you have to have? The number one thing, of course, you need is to understand information technology, hard drives, RAM, operating systems. You need to understand uh, encryption techniques. You need to know all these things to understand how to get the data off devices. Um, you have to be able to use evidence to track down who was in control of a subject, uh, how logins work, figure out who's and changing time zones and so on. and. Uh, you need to know all the major operating systems. Most of the time it's Windows, but it's often Linux and Android for cell phones and uh, Apple for cell phones and computers and other things. So many technical skills can be helpful. It is quite common when working on a case that you do not really have the skills or equipment to do a thorough inspection of something. And then you may need to outsource to another person who is an expert in that and that's fine. You don't have to know everything yourself, but you have to understand the limits of your knowledge so you do not try to do something you are not competent to do, but instead call in another specialist if necessary. Um, there's the hard drive, the mold for rotating hard drives, which are not as common as they used to be. Now most people have switched to SSDs. And you need some legal expertise. You don't need to be a lawyer, but you need to understand the rules of evidence. Um, so you need to understand what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Um, for example, there's the Fourth Amendment, protecting things from search and seizure. So if you are on a police case, then you can only do what the search warrant allows you to do. If you're working at a corporation, which is where most of the jobs are, then you're really investigating crimes that happen inside a company. And then it's usually pretty simple. The company gives you authorization to inspect company equipment. But if you were to then try to examine people's personal devices, their cell phone and their home computer, then you might not be authorized to do that because that's not company equipment. That's why uh, when work from home started becoming a big thing uh, about 10 years ago, there was a big argument. A lot of companies tried to say, we must force people to use only the official company laptop for everything and only the official company BlackBerry and never their personal device. And what they found is your most productive employees were traveling everywhere, going to conferences, talking to people, and they really demanded to use their personal device. If you forced them to use just their company device for everything, then they would just quit and work somewhere else. And the lawyers at the company said, you know, this is going to make it really hard when we have to have a, a legal investigation 
because you've made this device that is used both for personal work and for company use, and it's not clear whether we're allowed to examine it. But that is where most of us are these days. Although I must say, I'm now a contractor working for several companies, and all the companies I've worked for have gone to great effort to force me to use only their official device with an air gap and such a virtual device or a real device. So in that case, there's a real clear separation between my personal stuff and company stuff, but often there is not a clear distinction and it leads to a lot of confusion. And you need communication skills. If you testify in court, you must be very clear. You must also write reports that go to your boss. You must communicate with your team. And you also, by the way, need to learn to shut up. There's non-disclosure agreements involved in all aspects of investigation. You will learn things that are internal use, like you might learn about a poor practice at a company or a security flaw at a company that led to a problem. You can't go talking about that. They've hired you to help cover up, you know, not exactly, I shouldn't say cover up, they've hired you to prevent a scandal. So there's some kind of problem in a company, some kind of security problem, there's malware going around. Your forensic examiners are part of the team to deal with that. And part of the deal is you don't go blabbing. If, if they must disclose something about it publicly, it will go through a public relations department and lawyers so they're careful in what they say. And they don't want you just blabbing your opinion about things. Just like your doctor is, helps you get better, but they don't tell other people about your medical problems because it's private. Anyway, um, so knowing linguistic skills is quite valuable. Knowing other languages is quite valuable. Um, and whatever you do, you have to continuously learn. This is why I'm in this business, I must say. I'm easily bored, so I like this field that's constantly moving. And uh, there's nothing moving as fast as IT work. And uh, the battle between the good guys and the bad guys, the cops and robbers on the internet is very fascinating, and it keeps you on your toes. So you just have to constantly be learning in this business. Uh, after you know it, there's a new thing every day. And like, again, they mentioned here the confidentiality. Um, if you learn internal things about a company or evidence off cell phone or something, you have to not just be blabbing that all over the place. You have to understand who you're supposed to talk to about that and who you're not supposed to talk to about that. So here's a history. In the 1980s, FBI created the Magnetic Media Program, later the Computer Analysis and Response Team. And they passed the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the main act used to prosecute hackers. This defined, way back in the 80s, before the internet, the idea of there being a crime where you um, use a computer in a way you're not authorized to use it. Then in the 90s, um, there was a 94 crime bill, and the Secret Service launched the Electronic Crimes Task Force, and so on. Then um, the first regional computer forensics lab came out in the 90s. There's a bunch of these, even some of them in Europe. Um, and then the Patriot Act came out in 2001 in response to the 9-11 um, attack, which made it much easier to investigate things. Um, then cryptocurrency appeared in 2010, Bitcoin and its derivatives, which led to a, no, a new generation of online crime and online illegal funds transfers to purchase illegal things. Uh, IoT devices expanded, and Edward Snowden in 2013 uh, greatly changed the privacy attitude of the world by exposing the um, ways in which the U.S. government was invading the privacy of American companies and treating them like adversaries, and that greatly um, expanded people's concerns, and it drove people to move to higher levels of encryption and to try to implement more privacy controls in their devices. So you can get your training various places. Carnegie Mellon is a leader. The computer forensic laboratories are, and there's courses like this. There's a bunch of training programs, and there's a bunch of professional certifications. Um, one of the ones that I hear most greatly sought for is in case certified examiner. Uh, in case certified examiner means you've been trained to use this one product called in case, which is what most police departments use. However, the FBI uses access data FTK, and so they'd want people with this certification. Those are the two main forensic products used. They're both very expensive, like fifty or $100,000 for ENCASE or FTK, but they're the professional ones used by large forensic agencies. What we're going to use in this course is Autopsy, which is a free open source alternative because, of course, we don't have the money to pay for these expensive ones. It does more or less the same thing, but it's not quite as fancy. And uh, now I've got a Kahoot. So let me bring up one of them. 
these are little review series review questions to uh, let's see I guess I'm gonna need to log in just to stop people from falling asleep so much I have reviewed this one here should get me to my cahoots all right all right Oh, it occurs to me um, let me stop this for a minute uh, I gotta change I gotta make sure the settings are displaying on everybody's machine and uh, it might take me a minute to find it um, maybe I do it after I start it okay because uh, I made this new Kahoot. My old ones are all set to do this. For people who tune in online with Twitch, it's important to display the questions on your machines so that it's not delayed. And I might have to try a couple times to figure out where that setting is. So I, if I start it, These settings? Ah, maybe some. Ah, here, here's the settings. Okay. Let me just make sure my settings are correct. Show questions and answers. That's the one that matters. Okay, good. Then we're okay. So go to Kahoot.it and put in that pin to join. And these are worth extra credit. The people who get the three highest scores, they get three points every time I do this. So it can add up. There's a delay in the Twitch, so that's why I brought the coot to broadcast the questions directly to your devices so you won't have to wait for the Twitch to catch up. This is optional, by the way. You don't have to do it, but it's worth extra credit if you do. It's extra credit if you win, that is. The top three people will get extra credit. I'll give it a few more seconds to see if we got any more people coming. All right, I guess that's it. Let's start. All right. So what evidence contains GPS? All right, those are images. Records it when you take the picture with your cell phone, typically. All right. 
Okay, what evidence can you collect without a warrant? Email. Uh, email that's more than 180 days old can be collected without a warrant, which is a strange loophole in the law. All right, so what skill is useful for collecting evidence from Windows? PowerShell is Microsoft's new scripting language, very powerful and an important skill to know. It only runs on Windows. You might be able to have Python running on Windows, but it's not there by default. PowerShell is your main tool. All right. And which one is an important forensic certificate? Yep, in case. The most sought after certificate. All right, let's see who won. All right, I hope that's close enough to real name. If it's not, then you'll have to tell me more so my grader can tell who you are. J. Hove Apple, DLR, that's just like real initials. And one last is definitely not a real name. So if you want your points, you'll have to tell me someplace, like in the chat up there, your real name. All right, and let me say one more thing about this. So there are quizzes after these lectures. Um, you go to modules, and uh, there's a quiz after each one, and the quiz has um, questions that are not necessarily in this summary here. You have to look in the real textbook to find some of them, or you'll have to Google them. There were, I think, two out of 10 questions were not in this summarized lecture, but in the book. Yeah, Jay Hovani. Uh, okay, good, I see that. So the real name was pretty close. It's one apple is likely not to get their points. Like one one last. I don't know who that is at all. I don't doesn't sound like a real name. Okay, good. I see DLR. Yeah, the two people. Would, yep. All right. I got two of the names. There may be more coming. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop this recording.